Welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, a look back at the history of medicine and healthcare. Today's video is on the history of vitamins. All of us were told as children that we need to eat our vitamins if you want to be strong and healthy. And that message obviously stuck for the majority of us. Because over half of adults in places like America say that they take some form of vitamin supplements. But you might be surprised to learn that vitamins were only first discovered just over a hundred years ago. So how did we go from them being a completely unknown entity to the billion dollar industry it is today? And should we really be taking vitamin supplements at all? Both these questions will be answered in this video. So to find all this out, we're going to go through the history of these fascinating substances. The first thing I want to do is to give you a quick crash course of our current knowledge about human nutrition. All the food you put into your mouth can be divided into macronutrients and micronutrients. The macronutrients of which you need to eat large amounts of to survive are your carbohydrates, fats and proteins whereas the micronutrients which you only need small amounts of to survive are the minerals which are a bunch of chemical elements and the vitamins which are a bunch of chemical compounds. The 13 vitamins all play a key role in vital physiological processes but the human body can't produce them by itself so we have to get them from outside sources like food. Otherwise, specific diseases will develop based on which vitamin is deficient. But like I mentioned at the start, vitamins were only discovered about 100 years ago, and before them, no one knew for sure what caused these diseases. But whenever these diseases did appear throughout history, the doctors at the time tried to cure it using the classical methods that they tried for other diseases, like bloodletting, herbal remedies, and sometimes using specific foods. And you might be surprised to find out that they did occasionally stumble onto the right cures using foods. For example, the Asia Egyptians successfully used cow liver to cure night blindness, which we now know is caused by a deficiency in vitamin A something that's extremely abundant in the liver of many mammals. Another Asia example of successful treatment can be found in Chinese medical texts from the 3rd century, which claimed that soybeans were the cure to a disease that exactly matched the description of vitamin B1 deficiency, or beriberi, which we're going to talk about more later in this video. But probably the most famous historical use of food to cure disease is one that many of you might have heard about which is from the English doctor James Lind in the 18th century when he cured scurvy, which was a very common disease in sailors. What he did is now known as the first ever randomised control trial, in which he randomly assigned a bunch of sailors who had scurvy to receive various treatments, which had all been previously rumoured as being cures for the disease. As it turns out, the people who received lemons fully recovered, so Dr. Lind would use these spectacular findings and convinced other naval doctors to recommend that citrus fruit should always be brought onto voyages, which certainly saved the lives of thousands of sailors over the next few centuries. But unfortunately, the idea of curing specific diseases using food failed to catch on with the wider medical community at first because people at the time had many other ideas about what caused diseases like scurvy and rickets, with the theories ranging from a lack of exercise, bad air or toxins, to even possibly infectious microbes when germ theory was first discovered, because that was all the rage at the time. So these mysterious diseases continued to kill millions worldwide, but a group of scientists would make some clever observations around the turn of the 20th century which would change how we think about food forever.
It's important to highlight that at the end of the 20th century, scientists believed that all you needed to survive was carbohydrates, fats, proteins and the elements. But this idea was disproved by an English biochemist called Frederick Hopkins in 1906, who made a name for himself as he was an expert in the processes of how body cells generate energy. In one of his experiments, he tried to feed rats a diet consisting an extract of pure carbohydrate, fat, protein and minerals, but these rats failed to grow properly and got many diseases. But strangely, by adding only 2 milliliters of milk per day to this extract, the rats grew perfectly well. So that led Hopkins to propose that milk contained some unknown accessory factors that were present in quote, astonishingly small amounts. And he also theorised that these accessory factors could prevent diseases like scurvy, rickets, pellagra and beriberi. It turned out that the first of these accessory factors had actually already been discovered about 9 years before Hopkins, but it was at the other side of the planet. The person behind this discovery was a Dutch doctor called Christian Eichmann, who travelled to the Dutch East Indies colony, now part of modern day Indonesia, to study beriberi. The symptoms of beriberi result from damage to the nervous system, leading to problems like sensory loss and muscle weakness, and can even cause memory impairments and heart failure in the most severe cases. During Eichmann's time in the Dutch Indies colony, he found that beriberi was especially common in military personnel, and something he observed about them was that they were fed a fairly basic but still quite calorific diet of mainly white rice. He then noticed that some local chickens who were given the military's leftover rice began to develop the exact same symptoms. But then a chance event occurred, as a new military cook took over, who decided to stop feeding the chickens the leftover rice and instead gave them plain old brown rice. And to Eichmann's surprise, the symptoms of beriberi disappeared from the chickens within days. So what's the difference between brown rice and white rice? Well, white rice is made in a process called polishing, where you take brown rice, then remove two of the outer layers from it. This process adds some flavour to the white rice, and also gives it a longer shelf life. But Eichmann used his observation to figure out that it must also be removing a mysterious substance that was essential to normal health. And he would go on to name this substance the anti-beriberi factor. The person who introduced the name vitamins has probably the coolest name of any medical pioneer you'll hear about in this channel. Casimir Funk, a Polish biochemist. Funk took a keen interest in Hopkins and Eichmann's findings in 1913, and he ran some chemical analysis on the anti-beriberi factor from brown rice which previously hadn't been isolated, and found that it contained an amine group. He agreed with the conclusion that Hopkins made, and believed that several of these amine-containing accessory factors exist, and that they are vital for life. So he proposed a new catchier name for these accessory factors, vital amines or vitamins. More of these accessory factors would eventually be discovered over the next few decades, but they weren't all amines, so the E was dropped, and the official name was changed to vitamins. These vitamins all seem to be miraculous substances, as feeding people only a tiny amount of them was able to completely reverse the course of numerous devastating diseases. Once a new vitamin was discovered, they were assigned different letters of the alphabet, although they did have to make some revisions as some of these new substances were found to not actually be vitamins. And the general public started to become more aware of them, as doctors and health magazines everywhere began to emphasise how important it is to get your vitamins.
World War II was a key factor in the growth of the popularity of vitamins, which to be honest was partly sparked by fear, as governments around the world wanted to guarantee that the soldiers got all the necessary nutrients to be as strong as possible, and the civilian population were also scared that the rationing of food might lead to severe vitamin deficiencies. So this caused national health organisations to draft up the first ever list of recommended daily intakes of nutrients, and they happened to find out that a significant proportion of the population weren't getting enough vitamins. This led to two important things happening. Firstly, many governments around the world started to either recommend or mandate that specific staple foods must be fortified by vitamins to reduce the incidence of deficiencies. And these programs have indeed been a massive success wherever they've been implemented. Examples include adding folate to flour, which has drastically decreased the incidence of spinal defects in newborn babies, or the fortification of milk with vitamin D, causing less cases of rickets. The second effect of new nutritional guidelines was the mass production of artificial vitamin pills and the explosion of the vitamin supplement industry. They've marketed the hell out of themselves over the past few decades, and this led everyone to begin believing that extra vitamins were a key to good health, and the industry is now worth nearly $150 billion a year. And this past year has shown a further surge in the popularity of taking vitamins, due to many people's belief that things like vitamin D can prevent the complications of COVID-19. But I've got a bone to pick with this industry, and to be honest, I'm not so sure that a perfectly healthy person should really be taking vitamin supplements. The research on vitamins has now shifted from seeing if they can prevent deficiencies, to now seeing if they can improve overall health, and many studies have been done to check if supplementation reduces the risk of things like cancer, heart attacks, or overall mortality risk. However, these studies have so far been quite disappointing. Take this one, a paper that combined the results of 21 randomised trials that tested the effects of multivitamin supplementation on all-cause mortality, but they concluded that it has no effect. Or this 2018 paper, which looked at studies that specifically tested vitamin D supplementation on the risk of getting cancer or dying from it but this one also showed no benefits. More relevant to COVID-19, this meta-analysis is literally days old. It showed that vitamin D reduced the chance of getting a respiratory infection by only 1% and had no effect on more serious complications like hospitalisation or death. And I know some people will say they take vitamins just in case they have a deficiency, but there's actually some instances where taking vitamin pills might be harmful, because like any chemical, you can have too much of a good thing. For example, pregnant women should not take vitamin A due to the risk of developmental abnormalities. Vitamin D might possibly increase the risk of stroke and heart attack because of its effect on calcium levels. And some studies have shown that high dose vitamin E supplementation increases all cause mortality. Add this on to the fact that the vitamin industry has lobbied hard over the past years, and now they are basically unregulated, as vitamin companies don't even have to prove that the pills contain the ingredients they claim to have, and they don't even have to prove that they are safe. So should we really be taking these supplements at all? Until we do something similar to what James Lynn did back in 1747, and get good randomised trials showing clear benefits, it seems like many of us should maybe refrain from extra vitamins for now. As a doctor, I only prescribe vitamins to people with objective evidence of a deficiency, or those at risk of one, and in my opinion, the best way to get your vitamins is from a balanced diet of unprocessed animal and plant foods, which contain not just vitamins, 
but thousands of other chemicals that have protective effects to your body, which you can never replicate in a single vitamin pill. And let me make this disclaimer, vitamins are no doubt important for normal body function, but I think people have taken the role of vitamins in human health a bit too far. The discovery of them was a fascinating story and has been responsible for saving millions of lives over the last century. But I hope you agree with me when I say that we should reserve the artificial vitamins for those with deficiencies who really need it.